Well, troops, it's time to get arty. Um, it's a singular pleasure to be sharing this stage with a man I've known for a number of years now, and I'm honoured to call a good friend. Um, let me introduce, well, let me introduce Harold MPG Orostrakov. He is a global level artist, writer, historian. I mean, the, the plaudits go on and on and on. Um, he, he was called an, unor an orthodox Christian, but an unorthodox historian in Der Spiegel not long ago. He puts on the most revolutionary art installations I've ever come across. And it's a true pleasure for us to interview each other on this stage. Ladies and gentlemen, this is fantastic. It should continue and continue. <laughs> I have the pleasure to introduce a, a remarkable man, also a friend, who is not only an honored author, essayist, theater maker, the founder of uh, Grammar of Witchcraft, we talk about uh, Shakespeare Noir, but also a Valentian bishop and an actor, Reverend David Perry. Oh, it just suddenly struck me as I'm sat here, the concept of the dandy and the concept of the desperate pastor. <laughs> so that's why I'm wearing my tit for this afternoon, by the way. Um, Harold M. P. You have an incredibly interesting, diverse, challenging background that led you to genuinely revolutionary art. You're a series of ethnic mixtures, therefore you know what it feels like to be on the receiving side of things. You've also been a migrant, your family were migrants, and these are very topical issues nowadays. Would you care to tell us something about that milieu and what led you to art? Oh, I'm a son of immigrants, as you know, ladies and gentlemen. That means that uh, after a journey twice in the last century, my family, I found myself with five years old in the refugee camp of Treskirchen in Austria, which in a world which uh, I didn't even understand uh, the science or the language. So that means that I became something like a wanderer not only by destiny, and then, you know, then I chose this kind of uh, migration. That means that I understood that one of the major problems is a problem of communication and the inability and between the people, between the genders, between the generations, and at least between East and West. So when I started to work, I started to create a language, looking the world and trying to make it objective. I suppose my own work, you know, there was life before the internet for younger people in this audience. You know, work disappears nowadays. I mean, I, I was manning, if that's the word nowadays, I, I believe there were, what, what was Solby saying? 112 gender identities now. Good Lord. You know, I was manning the barricades for LGBT as it was in those days. There are so many letters nowadays, I can't remember what they all are and what they all signify. But uh, way before I met uh, eminent friends in the audience, we were protesting manfully about and womanfully about equality, uh, rights before the law, and my own family are also migrants. Um, if we go back to great, great ancestors, all of my, my, my folk are actually Irish. Um, I've got a Welsh streak in me. So, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new... A friend of mine is an anthropologist up in Bath, I think, who's writing a, a thesis at the moment about everyone's a migrant. How about something more revolutionary? We're all indigenous because there's nobody without a series of identities that link somewhere else and link to the link away to the far and exotic, you know. Which leads me to my next point, I suppose. Um, Harold Ampey doesn't want me to talk about the Moscow conceptualists. Um, I'm very happy talking about the Moscow conceptualist. Uh, why, and I thought he made a very good point before we were uh, coming on stage, he doesn't fit in anywhere. I'm sure everyone in this room knows that feeling. You know, you're trying to fit in somewhere, you're trying to get the best out of things, but it's working and it's not working. And every time I look up the list of Moscow conceptualists, we talk about what conceptualist art is in a moment, He's, he's on the list, he's off the list, he's on the list, he's off the list. And it's yet another example 
of transcending categories and somehow falling between two stools at the same time. And, you know, that is the condition of our world nowadays, for good or ill. Harold M.P., why do you think you keep bounding around between categories? We're living in a situation of dogmas, you know, and in this kind of, this is already a category. So I can just give you a small example, a very living one. 91, I was invited uh, to Moscow. It was the last minute of the Soviet Union, the shadow of it. And I found an incredible crowd of young artists in Chista Prudach, you know, things which became then valuable. They became a part of the art business. But in this moment, it was for the first time after years. And to understand what I want to say is, you know, when I started in the beginning of the 80s to work on the concept of Byzance, this was a journey to a nowhere land. It was a Byzance après Byzance. And when uh, Moscow became the third Rome, it was also a Byzance without Byzance. You know, it was already gone. It was already Ottoman Empire. So we are talking about things, we, we talk about things which are not anymore. So that means that art is making things visible. And, and then they are becoming an objective reality. And when what I met in Moscow was a certain poetry which in the West at that time, and that was at that time, you know, already in Biennial of Venice and documentaries and whatever, was already business. And in this small moment of a disaster in feeling, you could believe that it's possible to shake the world. And that's my question to you back. The theater man, the essayist, and the bishop, with whom I'm talking now. Gosh, what a good question. Um, I suppose the bishop, because I've got the collar. <laughs> Um, conceptualism in theatre, I suppose, when I'm wearing a different cap, that's roughly what I'm sort of known for, I dip into theatre. I don't make it my career. Um, I find that sort of drudgery deeply depressing and one ends up doing commercial project after commercial project, which is fine. But maybe there's a bit more to theatre than just entertainment. Um, certainly, I want to throw in a very unusual name, J.B. Priestley, is actually an influence on me. Um, and I read scripts assiduously before I decide to do them or not. Um, which leads me to not talk about clergy, but conceptualist art in itself. I think that's still the revolutionary power in modern art. The concept, we are our concepts. We are what we think we are. You know, <clears throat> years back, there was a, a, a Japanese making of King Monkey, the ch very famous Chinese poem, the Wu Chen Eng. And it was a spoof. It was funny. And there was a big woman who was Buddha. <clears throat> and the King Monkey came on at the very beginning and said, quoting the Buddha, with our thoughts, we make the world. And I think that's true. What are we when we're not in our thoughts? And what are our thoughts apart from concepts? Art. Uh, conceptualism in British theatre, like conceptualism in art, <clears throat> in my mind, is focusing on a particular concept or series of related concepts to not only explore them, but enlighten the mind. Does this make any sense to you? Before I hand you the mic back, beauty. Beauty, I know I'm being cheeky. Beauty, there, there's a saying going around at the moment, Joseph Kosuth, Kosuth you know him. Um, beauty has no place in art. Gosh. Harold Ampey, the floor is yours. This is a mistake, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing counts without beauty. Yeah. Nothing. There is not a possibility, you know, to think something, to make something without to believe that it's possible to create an elegant, a poetic thing, you know, against this kind of banality. And when you, when you mentioned Joseph Cossett, Joseph Cossett is a member of Art and Language. Art and Language is the first movement which uh, divided the form from the, uh, from the content, you know. And this was a tricky, tricky thing, because they, they understood that they have to do in this kind of global business, which started already end of the 60s, they had to give something. 
to give something which you can believe in. So when I was stepped out creating a space which is spiritual, they said, we have to close this space. But this was also a policy, you know, it was an ideological, ideological concept to create something which is invisible. It's like a, a speechless observation. And this speechless observation then became itself the, the issue. So therefore, if we talk about conceptual art, if we talk about conceptualism in general, we don't have to forget that conceptualism died with Duchamp. And what happened after that was the conclusion and an absolutely disaster of civilization in the Second World War. So what happened after the Second World War was not a conceptualism in this kind of aesthetical category. It was just a surviving problem of people who lost faith, you know? And, and what is the point behind today in this kind of chaotic times, and at the same time, we are back in something which in the 19th century was called the Big Bang. All of these areas in a total imminence we live in, in no island left, you know, where you can escape. This is the real conceptualism in art, not to escape, but to create the island. And you did. Oh, wow. Um, what Harold Lampy is referring to is what I, in the old days, when I first moved to London, nobody's from London, are they? Everybody moves here and do, does stuff. Um, in the old days before the Donmar had become a ver venerable institution and was experimental, we used to spend evenings running about between theatre and theatre and theatre, looking for spaces to create something new, even if that's possible. I don't know. I don't know. Um, something happened. Something happened. And I'll tell you, this leads into the next element of our talk. Um, you've got two very unlikely refugees from all sorts of scenarios in front of you. We're both toying at the moment with the idea of radical tradition. <clears throat> Can we take anything from the past on an aesthetic level? Let me give you something uh, I'm struggling with on the level of ideas at the moment. I'm beginning to think something like conceptualism is actually phenomenology yes. mixed with subjective idealism. So it's not just a phenomena, a fact, an action, an event. It's also my feelings. You know, we're all so brain-centered these days. What are my feelings and instincts towards that? That sums up a lot of Harold Lampy's work, and certainly it's beginning to influence me as a discovery. I think you embody radical traditionalism. I think your, your work is moving increasingly in that direction. Taking the best, but promoting the future. What do you think, my friend? Um, I'm, I'd like to listen to you. And I was... So do I. And I was thinking, you know, by when, when, when I go back, when we talk about something which is traditional, we talk about art history. And I mean, that's a fact we have to accept. Looking to art means looking to knowledge. Without knowledge, you can't really get, you know, this kind of fantastic intellectual entertainment. For example, okay, radicalism on theater. You know, my first works being theatralic because my, the basic of my thinking was always writing and drawing. I mean, as a man who grew up without a language with five years, you know, German is my first language today, living between Vienna, Cannes, and later on, Geneva, and so on, for me, it was impossible to get a map, to believe in this map without to draw it by myself. What I want to say is, when, you, when we talk about theater, about really radical theater, then go back to symbolism of André Bieli. Something like St. Petersburg. Nothing can be more radical, more anarchic, more dandy-like, and more surrealistic at this. Because he's giving you, you know, the map of a city which doesn't exist, by exist is existing. Or go back to Meyerhold. I mean, the first man in theater who made an empty stage was not Peter Brooks. Yeah. It was Meyerhold, you know? It was Meyerhold at the end of the century. Out of this empty stage, Mayakovsky came up, yeah. And he said, you are the cheetah. Yeah. 
So how can we continue, you know, with this kind of radical statements, with this kind of attitude? What happened is that uh, by losing this historical facts, we tried to invent something which was not as strong as it was before. So this is one part of the problem. And the second thing is, in the moment it becoming a business, you know, then every information is an information. Is an in a, it's just an information war, you know. It's 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 an accumulation of informations, and and you can't escape anymore from this. So you have to go back. You have to drop the time, and really, to go subversive against it. And sadly, on that note, we have to finish. Um, Harold Lampy and I are around uh, during the rest of this event. It's been a great pleasure to give this POMO view of what we're trying to do. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Thank you. And thank you.